I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Wednesday, April 27th, 2022, and we are live. Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation, the future of radio. And we're also broadcasting on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Well, today was a very busy day, and um, we're just a few days away from the One Africa Power and Unity Conference. And as I told you on uh, Sunday's show and Monday's show, uh, today we're going to be joined by one, another one of my teachers, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene. You've seen him in the Hidden Colors documentaries. You've seen him in, uh, we're in the uh, Black Friday uh, documentary series together, as well as uh, we're also in uh, Elementary Genocide Part 3 from director Raheem Shabazz. He's going to join us here in a few minutes, and we're going to uh, talk some about his topic. Uh, he's going to be one of the presenters at the One Africa Power and Unity Conference. And we're going to uh, discuss this topic uh, at the conference, which is Pan-Africanism through the power of unity and knowledge of self. Pan-Africanism through uh, the power of unity and knowledge of self. All right. So, uh, you know, the conference is coming up uh, Saturday, April 30th and uh, Sunday, May 1st. You've been hearing the um, ads here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. I'll be there as well. Be sure to come by my vendor booth in the African marketplace because uh, I have my DVD lectures there. I'll be registering people for my online history classes and you can talk to me also. So uh, we're going to speak with Professor Kaba today. We're going to speak with Professor Kaba uh, here in just a minute. Um, and then also I want to do, uh, there was a story dealing with Emmett Till that I saw uh, a couple days ago, uh, that, that April 22nd. Associated Press has this story, and it was picked up by the Detroit Free Press. Uh, all, all the news outlets carried this story. Uh, Emmett, Till's, Emmett Till's relatives want the woman who accused him prosecuted for 1955 kidnapping. Now, I posted this on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, and it got, uh, I think, close to 3,000 likes and hundreds of comments, okay? So we're going to talk, uh, we're going to talk about this uh, as well, okay? This is very interesting, all right? Uh, Emmett Till's relatives want the woman who accused him uh, prosecuted for 1955 kidnapping. And what we found out uh, in, in this article here is that back in 1955, so we know Emmett Till was, was killed August 28th, uh, 1955 in uh, Money, Mississippi. At the time, uh, there was a warrant issued for Carolyn Bryant, who was the wife of uh, Roy Bryant, who was one of the men who killed Emmett Till. Uh, there was an arrest warrant for her for uh, being involved in Emmett Till's kidnapping. And the uh, arrest warrant, the authorities at the time said the woman had two young children and they did not want to bother her. Um, so the arrest warrant was never executed. OK, the uh Emmett Till's family want authorities to launch a kidnapping prosecution against the woman who set off the lynching by accusing Emmett Till of improper advances in 1955. FBI records show uh, Carolyn Bryant was never arrested or brought or brought to trial in a case that shocked the world for its brutality. So we're going to talk some about this because there are many roadblocks here um, in this case. One of the roadblocks is basically all the witnesses are dead. One. Two, uh, from reading the article here, the um, the authorities don't know where the original arrest warrant is. OK. And you need to have witnesses and have evidence. All right. So. Uh, we'll, we'll talk some about this. And, you know, we've dealt with uh, Emmett Till here on the show numerous times. We know when the 
uh, Department of Justice a couple of months ago when the Department of Justice closed his case. Um, we broke this down here on this show and explained why the Department of Justice could not bring charges. OK, and uh, many people were under the impression that uh, Carolyn Bryant um, had recanted her testimony. OK, and as we went through and broke down the actual evidence, as we went through and broke down the actual evidence, there's no evidence. There's no evidence that Carolyn Bryant uh, actually recanted her testimony. OK, so we broke this down here on this show and we actually went through the um, we actually went through the 16 page Department of Justice uh, report that they put out when they closed the investigation. OK, so we're going to talk about that uh, as well. Uh, I want to give you a quick update on a story that we dealt with on Monday show dealing with Ben Crump suing Wells Fargo over African Americans being discriminated against when it comes to refinancing home mortgages. Uh, I, I wanted to get to the follow up to that story on yesterday's show, but, but we were so busy. We had Sister Felicia on from the One Africa Power and Unity Conference. We also talked about uh, Joe Biden signaling that he's going to cancel some student loan debt in addition to the $17 billion has already been canceled. So I didn't get to get a chance to get to that story. All right. So we'll deal with that and we'll speak to Professor uh, Kava in just a minute here. All right. Um, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Uh, what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. All right, um, let's jump. Let's jump into this first story here, and uh, this deals with uh, waiting on uh, to get Brother Cobb on the line. So this deals with uh, this story right here, dealing with Emmett Till. Okay, and just a second. All right. Uh, Shakita, do me a favor. Can you get uh, Professor Cobb on the line, please? Well, okay, so you know we covered this story on, on uh, Monday. Now, back in March, there was a huge report from um, there was a huge report from Bloomberg, okay? Bloombergnews.com. Wells Fargo uh, rejected half its black applicants in mortgage refinancing boom. Wells Fargo uh rejected half its uh black applicants for mortgage refinancing uh half its black applicants in mortgage refinancing boom fewer than half of black Af applicants were approved by the biggest bank mortgage lender all right so and as we talked about uh, a couple of days ago uh 47 percent of african-american uh, African Americans who applied for a re to apply to refinance their, their home mortgage with Wells Fargo, only 47 percent uh, were approved. OK, uh, compared to 72 percent of uh, white homeowners who were approved to refinance their home mortgage. OK, now on Monday, April 25th, 2022, civil rights attorney Benjamin Crump held a press conference alleging Wells Fargo's discriminatory loan practices kills black opportunity. Uh, ben Crump, who has represented the families of Ahmaud Arbery and uh, Breonna Taylor, held the press conference at, the, at uh, the Mount Zion Second Baptist Church in Atlanta and included several black homeowners who have joined the class action lawsuit against Wells Fargo Bank. All right, let's just go to break. You listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation and Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry. It's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. 
The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. Hotel and Application Network show we deal with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism is. Racism is a power structure. There was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It's only laws and policies that take us out. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. We have it all on 910 AM Superstation. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. Once again, it is Wednesday, uh, April 27th, 2022. Uh, on the line, we're joined by uh, another one of my teachers and one of the presenters uh, at the One Africa Power in Unity Conference taking place uh, in Detroit, Saturday, April 30th, and uh, Sunday, May 1st, at the Double Tree Hotel. We want to back, welcome back to the African History Network show, um, Professor Kabahai Waka Kamene. Hotel, brother, how you doing tonight? Hotel to my brother in the hotel. Thank you for the invitation, brother. Been looking forward to this conversation. We go back a ways, brother. Yes. <laughs> and I'm just happy to be back here with you again. Absolutely, man. Going back to like, 2009 man and then and i remember you came to speak at the uh uh african uh the african village man the, the convocation of the african village so yeah we go back a ways brother <laughs> oh yeah oh and you brought me to detroit a couple times too. yes you oh yeah, yeah we did that too we did some uh joint lectures together also yep absolutely man yeah. so yeah no so, doubt. so uh people are looking forward to your presentation that's coming up uh this weekend and your topic you're going to deal with uh in a nutshell uh pan-africanism through the power of unity and knowledge of self and for those that are not familiar with professor Kaba, he's a historian uh he's he uh, taught in uh the public school system in new york uh, all different grades but he's a historian uh he's an author lecturer he's in the documentaries we're in elementary genocide part three together from director raheem shabazz we're in the black friday series from uh uh director rick mathis uh he's also in uh, the hidden colors documentaries and uh also 1804 as well from director Tariq nasheed so um brother give people a synopsis of what you're going to talk about uh in the in your presentation point that I'm trying to make, as I looked at all the other great scholars that will be there and the information that they'll be sharing, mm -hmm. I wanted to come from the perspective to understand that uh, when we talk about One African United, um, one of the things I've come to realize is that before you can unite with somebody else, and that could be anybody outside yourself, right? before you can unite with anyone else outside of yourself, you have to first unite with yourself. Yes. And the way in which I believe you unite with yourself is to know yourself. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes important that self-knowledge, know who you are. And when I say this, brother, I'm not just speaking as an African. Yes. I'm speaking about as a human being, as an organism that's living on the earth. Who are you? Why are you here? Right. What's your purpose? Each and every one of us has been given a divine purpose to fulfill, no matter who we are, no matter where we find ourselves in the station of life. We all have a purpose. And I believe as an educator, one of the things that I worked on with our students was to facilitate them finding that purpose, not giving it to them. Right. You can't tell somebody what the purpose is. Only the person can know that. But it is the self-exploration that allows you to facilitate and understand who you are and what gift you've been given. Every human being has been given a gift. Right. No matter what it may be, all of us have a gift. You to facilitate and understand who you are, 
how do you make it better? Dr. John Henry Clark likens it to be my teacher, always says, look at you, that's before I was college. Yes. He said, perfect your craft. Always be better. Mm-hmm. Always know you can be better. And so what I'm attempting to do is to talk about the importance of uniting with brothers and sisters around the world. I, like Dr. Clark, my proverb is, and, and by the way, I'm a foundational black American. Okay. And, and because of this conversation we're having, it's important for us to be able to, at least from where I'm coming from, I can be a foundational black American and also be a pan-African. Mm-hmm. Because to me, if it's pan-African or perish, this is about the clause you see. Yeah. No one group is going to get out ahead over everybody else. We're either going to do, we're either going to stand together or we're going to fall apart. Exactly. And, you know, I just had uh, Dr. Leonard Jeffries on on Sunday, and that's one of the things he talked about, Pan-Africanism or perish. But go ahead. You know, for for me, that's the bottom line. And and I believe that I have dedicated my life to my people. I've dedicated my life to peoples of African-American descent, Mm -hmm. foundational black American, however we want to term that. I've lived my life doing that, but never at the expense of another brother or sister from another part of the diaspora. If you are from Ghana, you're my family. If you are from Jamaica, you are my family. Mm -hmm. If you are from Puerto Rico, you are my family. Whether you embrace it or not, whether you accept it or not, that's your business. But as far as I'm concerned, the African diaspora is my family. But at the same time, I can also be proud of my people who come from the colonies, come from the continental United States of America. Right. And I believe that if you're Jamaican, you should look out for your people. You should look out for other Jamaican people. If you're from Puerto Rico, you should look out for other Puerto Rican people. If you are an African from Holland, you should look out for other your your people. Because as we, as each group, get ourselves together, we then make a better contribution to the diaspora itself and Africa, the continent, in herself. Yes. But you've got to know yourself. Beyond just your culture, you have to know your place in the cosmic reality. Absolutely. And that's what I'd like to talk about. And I'd like to talk about the science of how to study it. Okay, the science of how to study. Now, let me ask you this question here. Uh, let's deal with some definitions quickly, because people come to these conversations with different levels of understanding of history. So please define for people what Pan-Africanism is, because you have some people who say, well, Africans are not Pan-Africanists. And you have some people thinking that they have to... Um, uh, Pan-Africanism is a religion or something like that, or I ain't no African, you know I'm black. So explain to people what is Pan-Africanism. Okay. From my definition, mm-hmm. just, just, just the way I'm contributing my ideas. Okay. Pan, Pan means all. Yep, in Greek. Yep. Af- Africa means Africa. So Pan-African means all African. Now let me give you an African terminology. Okay. Like my brother Bob and Heru has given us. Okay. It's called Nebu Afraka. Nebu, Nebu means all. Mm-hmm. But not just all in the terms of human beings, all in terms of nature. Okay. And Afraka, A F R A K A, Afraka, it means the very nature of the flesh of all that embodies us as a people and as a nature. Okay. So to me, an African is, if you want to be specific, it is all people who embrace their African history and culture. All people who embrace yeah. their African history and culture. Yes. Yeah. Now, I, I, I made a little bit of a, a, a change in a sense because, you know, we talk about people who say that, well, there are Africans who don't embrace African Americans. There are African Americans that do not embrace people from the Caribbean. Mm-hmm. And, I, and there are African Americans that don't embrace their own African American. That's what I'm about to say. And there are African people that don't embrace themselves. The African Americans who hate <laughs> their own people. And largely, we have to understand, Brother Cobb, and I'm going to let you finish. We have to understand we African people in this country have largely been taught to hate themselves and see reality through the eyes of Europeans. 
Okay, so we we have, we have to come to that realization. That that's that's, that's at the foundation. Absolutely. That's why we have to reclaim African history and culture because Bantu Stephen Biko, one of our great South African freedom fighters, who was portrayed by Denzel Washington in the movie in 1987, Cry Freedom. Bantu Stephen Biko said the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. So we have to take our minds back. That's it. That's it. And you know that's the bottom line. You know, I'll give you an example. I always tell this story about uh, back in the day. Um, I, I was introduced in 1975 to to a musician by the name of Bob Marley from Jamaica. Bob Marley, Bob Rasta Marley. I was mm -hmm. uh, Bob Bob Rasta Marley. Bob Marley. Bob Marley. Okay. Okay, and I and I, I heard a song he sang called Trenchtown Rock. Yes. And I remember listening to that song. I had never been to Jamaica before. Okay. Wow. Uh, you know, when I go to Jamaica, I want to go to Trench Town. Okay, yes. And my wife and I, when we got married in 1981, uh, she, was, she was from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And we went for our honeymoon to Jamaica, and I met people there, and they said to me, is there anything you want to do? Like, you want to go to the Taino Museum? Do uh, you want to go to the Marcus Garvey Memorial? At the time, Bob Marley had already joined the ancestry, and they said, do you want to go to his memorial? Mm-hmm. And I said, yeah, I, I want to do all that. But one thing I want to do is go to Trenchtown. Trenchtown, yep. There were a lot of people that told me that Trenchtown was bad man's land. You don't want to go to Trenchtown. Okay. They robbed you. They, they, they beat you up. They beat you. And I said, no, nah, no, nah, I want to go to Trenchtown. And so we found somebody that would take us to Trenchtown. And um, we were driving in Kingston. And, you know, we kept driving, kept driving. And all of a sudden, the person that was going to bring us uh, stopped the car and they went in, inside and um, we were waiting, waiting, waiting for um, her to come back. Okay. And I said, "Wow, you know, it's, you know, it's taken her a long time uh, to um, to uh, come." And they said, "Well, no, she went in to change her clothes." Mm -hmm. And I said, "What do you mean?" She said, "Well, this is her house right here." Okay. And I looked around and I said, "But she lives in Trent's house." Because you know the way they were telling me, I was expecting to see something. Okay. And I looked around, and the only difference between her community and mine, I grew up in a project in New York, and our buildings were six stories high, and it, and it was concrete on the ground. Trenchtown was three story high, and it had a dirt path. That was the only difference between Trenchtown. A dirt path. And where I grew up. The, the point I'm making is that they make us afraid of ourselves. Yes. When brothers and sisters come. Or coming to America to stay away from an African American, they're bad people. Mm -hmm. Be scared of them. They rob you, they steal, they're into drugs. And so they make us afraid of each other so we never know each other. Exactly. Okay, hold, hold that thought right there, Professor Cabo. We're coming up on a break. Hold that thought right there. We're coming up on a break. They're playing my music. We'll let you continue on the other side of the break. Listen to the African History Network show. We're speaking with Professor Cabo Hiawatha Kamene, another one of my teachers. He'll be speaking at uh, this weekend's One Africa Power and Unity Conference. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have the information there. We'll give you more information on the other side of the break. We'll be back in a few minutes. Jeanette Davis is a well-established author with six published books. Black Survival in White America from Past History to the Next Century was published in 1995, and it delves into the history of African Americans before slavery up to contemporary times. The Great Divide Between Blacks and Whites was released in 2008, and her autobiography, Black Just Like My Mama, was published in 2010. Soulful Journey, The Business of Beings, was released in December 2021 and her two latest books, Echoes from the Heart, Love Throws Poetry, and Master Being Human were both published in January of 2022. Jeanette Davis' writings delve deeply into the psyche of black people from ancient to contemporary times. She cuts no corners and leaves no stones unturned in relating truth, letting the chips fall where they may on both African and European doorsteps. Order Jeanette Davis' books today at Amazon.com. Search for Jeanette Davis and get to know her work today. 
STEM Forward, helping our community find their place in the emerging fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Join us for our monthly live stream on our website, stemforwardedu.org. Watch, subscribe, share. Also join our mailing list to stay up to date with STEM resources and opportunities. STEM Forward, the future is now. Watch, subscribe, share. Nine ten, the Superstation, Detroit's only African American talk radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show, right here on Nine Ten AM Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Wednesday, April twenty seventh, and we're speaking with Professor Kabahia Watha Kamene. Um, the call in number is three one three seven seven eight seventy six hundred three one three seven seven eight. 7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. He's going to be speaking um, this weekend at the One Africa Power and Unity Conference. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have the information right on the homepage of our website and the link to click on to register. Uh, this is taking place Saturday, April 30th, Monday and Sunday, May 1st at the Double Tree Hotel, 525 West Lafayette Boulevard. If you cannot attend in person, you can live stream it around the world. I'll be there at the conference also. Be sure to come by my vendor booth and I'll have my DVD lectures there. I'll read, you can register for my online history classes that I teach also. Uh, so let's go back to the phone line. Okay, uh, Professor Kaba. So right before the break, we were talking about uh, uh, knowledge itself when we we're talking about Pan-Africanism and your concept of what Pan-Africanism is. Go ahead and finish your thoughts, please. My bottom line is that we have to introduce ourselves to each other. Yes. That's my point. My point is that when 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 uh, folk come here, we need to come together and begin to express ourselves as to who we are to our brothers. Yes. I have met phenomenal brothers and sisters from all around the world mm -hmm. who respect, admire, and identify with us as their brothers and sisters. I spend great deals of time talking to brothers and sisters like that. I also know that there are those that may not care to be there, and I understand that too. I spend my time talking to those who are listening. Right. And it is they who we speak to that are receptive to us that then can go and talk to others to explain to them who we are as a people. Because as an African-American, the one thing that's very important to understand when you come to America from any part of the world, mm -hmm. if you're coming to America for a better opportunity, you need to thank African Americans. Yes. Because African Americans is what made America great. Mm -hmm. it, is on, it is on our back that America was built as the place that would be the kind of place that would give benefit and would be beneficial for other people. But if you don't know that history, then you come here with the explanation that other people who would wish to have you be against us, and you believe them. Right. No place in the world that I've ever visited that I do not pay homage and respect to the elders of that community. Right, right. Wherever it may be, mm -hmm. in Mexico, uh, Holland, uh, UK, United Kingdom, Egypt, I pay homage to the Africans there. Because it is they who made their country what it is. Right. It is the African American, the foundational black American, that labored on the enslavement camps here in the United States and gave up their lives, their blood, their sweat, their tears, and fought for a better opportunity that made America the so called democracy that they claim it is. If you want to know how democracy is in America, look to the condition that African. Americans are in. And that can be your measuring stick as to the success of democracy. And right now, as I look, mm -hmm. America ain't doing too much. Right, right, exactly, exactly. And we're also fighting against uh, domestic terrorists and domestic terrorist sympathizers who um, are trying to overthrow the government, suppress our vote. The uh, 147 of them, 139 in the Senate, and 139 in the House, and uh, eight in the Senate. Uh, voted not to certify the, the 2020 election results. Um, and we, we see this constant erosion. We, we see this constant uh, attack 
not just on voting rights, but on African-Americans in general. We see these anti-black, anti-African policies being put in place. We look at uh, Governor Ron DeSantis in Georgia. We look at Brian Kemp in Florida. So uh, this is, as I've said before, uh, and I want to go to this slide here dealing with um, uh, a quick definition of Pan-Africanism uh, from uh, the book Pan-Africanism for Beginners here in just a second. But as I've said before, uh, all this is taking place right now, Brother Coblin, and you taught history. Um, this is a continuation of the Civil War and Reconstruction. OK, the January 6, 2021 insurrection is a continuation of the Civil War. And it's a continuation of of, of, of uh, Reconstruction ending the Compromise of 1877 and the uh, uh, attacks on African-Americans dur during uh, the Jim Crow era after uh, Reconstruction ends. It's a continuation of the Clinton, Mississippi uh, ride of 1875, Vicksburg, Mississippi massacre, 1874, all of that. So um, this, this is why it's so important to understand history. It, it, there was an article from uh, Time Magazine, and I have it up here on the screen so, so people can see it. Uh, this is an article I, I reference a lot, and I deal with this in um, my class that I teach dealing with from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. The name of this article is called A New Report Finds That 45 States Are Failing to Teach Students About the Period That Shaped Race Relations After the Civil War. They're talking about Reconstruction. And they they cite Eric Foner, historian Eric Foner, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning white historian. But he draws a direct connection between the violence, the political violence, January 6th, and the violence that was uh, imposed upon African-Americans that brought about an end to Reconstruction to one of the things was surrounding politics and to suppress our vote and the violence that continued after Reconstruction ended as well. Uh, you want to comment on that? Well, you know, that's why Dr. Clark would say, I'm surprised that you're yeah, surprised. Exactly. I'm surprised that you're surprised. Changed. Yep. Yep. Nothing has changed. This is who they've always been. Mm-hmm. When people talk about the danger of democracy falling, America has never been democratic. Yes. Yep. Not to so that, not to live up to its, its uh, not to live up to its its highest ideas and to really live up to the Constitution, what it promises in the Constitution. There's never been that. Not for us. Well, when they wrote the Constitution, oh. African people were enslaved and women weren't far behind that. Yes. Yep. So they never. They, they have never done this. Mm -hmm. So that this is a work in progress right now, yep. and it's African Americans who are the, the, the measuring of what a democracy is in America. Yep. Yep. Well, and so mm -hmm. what, what we, we as a people have to get ourselves together. We must take the initiative to reach out to our brothers and sisters and to let them understand this is why the One Africa Conference is so important, right. because we have people like Dr. Theophilia Obenga mm -hmm. and others who are coming with this knowledge and wisdom for us to be able to understand who we are as a people, as a global people. But I even take it further as it relates to the books that I've written, as it relates to us as a cosmic people, yes, as a people of nature. And so we have got to take into our hands. Dr. Clark also has a piece up on YouTube where it's titled, you ain't got no friend. Mm -hmm. And what's happening now, even between Ukraine and Russia, I'm, I'm doing a, a webinar series. Okay. And, it, and it's up on my Facebook page. It's also on my website, www.kabakamane.com, where I'm actually tracing what is going on as the African is moving into the northern climate, getting caught in an ice age, and how they're acting. Mm -hmm. What's going on between the Ukrainians and the Russians was going on 5,000 years ago. There's nothing new here. The conflict, yeah. The Ukrainians and the Russians are the same people. Yes, yeah. This is the Hatfields and McCoys. Right. They've been fighting each other. That's all they know is to fight each other. Yep. And, and if you go so back... We, go ahead. Go ahead and finish your thought. No, no, no. I'll follow you. Yeah, yeah. You, you go back to um, uh, you go back to before you when you had kingdoms in Europe, 
And you have after the fall of uh, the Roman Empire, 476 AD, when it's attacked, the Western portion, when it's attacked by the Vandals and the Visigoths, you look at that period of time that they call the Dark Ages, and you look at the uh, fighting between the Vandals, the Visigoths, the Anglos, the Saxons, the Lombards, the Jutes, the, the Franks, the Alans, the Pick, the Picts, all these what are called Germanic people or, or collectively called barbarians. Right. When you go study, then then they form from kingdoms, they form countries. Right. In 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 the, the, the Franks, you know, uh, uh, well, at one time it's called Gaul, but then it's called France. The Anglos and the Saxons, they go into what we call England. England's named after the Anglos. When you go and look at their history, just going back from, say, World War One, World War Two, back to when they were uh, Germanic people or barbarians and fighting and killing one another. They've been fighting and killing one another for hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, really over a thousand, really, were, really over just 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 in that they recent were at time. War during wars. Yes, yes. <laughs> they were listen. Go to Wikipedia mm -hmm. and put in the bar wars in Europe. Mm -hmm. I was going to do an overall presentation, but I have to stop because. So the, the, the listing of the wars in Europe went yeah. page after page after page. Right, right. Yeah. They, they have fought over fighting. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. And well, so what we're looking at now mm -hmm. is nothing more than the same of what has been going on for thousands of years. Yeah. OK, hold it right there. We're coming up on a break. When we come back from the break, I want to deal with this definition of Pan-Africanism and uh, let you finish up as well. Everybody you listen to the After History Network show. We're speaking with Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene. We'll be back in a few minutes. Abundant Capital Group is a real estate investment company with over 20 years of experience in real estate. They specialize in two areas of real estate. One. They solve real estate problems with creative financing solutions that give the seller the most money for their property. And two, they show individuals how to get a higher rate of return on their investment capital with real estate note investing. If you are looking to sell or need to sell your property, here is what they provide. Market value offer, even if you have little or no equity, they typically pay all closing, costs which can be thousands of dollars they close on a date of the seller's choosing and the seller does not have to be out of the house at the time of closing they take the property in an as-is condition and the seller is not required to make any repairs give them a call or email them today for a free consultation and see how they can help you with your real estate needs call them at 973-475-8488 that's 973-475-8488 visit their website abundantcapitalgroup.com that's abundantcapitalgroup.com and email them at acg at abundantcapitalgroup.com follow them on instagram and facebook at abundant capital group the work that I do is larger than the fashion industry. It's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on the Antenna and Superstation Future Radio. All right, we're speaking with uh, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene. He's a historian, lecturer, uh, author, uh, one of my teachers as well. We go back a number of years. And he's going to be one of the, one of the presenters at the One Africa Power and Unity Conference 
taking place uh, Saturday, April 30th, Sunday, May 1st at the Double Tree Hotel uh, right here in Detroit. OK, so we have the information at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com and click on the link there. You, you can register for the conference. If you cannot attend in person, you uh, there's also a ticket for the uh, live stream. So you can live stream the uh, two day conference and watch from around the world. OK. All right. So, uh, Professor Cabo, right, right before the break, you were talking about uh, wars in Europe. And uh, I went to uh, Britannica because I have a monthly subscription with Britannica. I pay them money each month. So I try to use these subscriptions that uh, I pay everybody. Washington Post, New York Times, Reuters, uh, Atlanta Journal-Constitution, uh, Britannica, this, uh, the, what is it, the Discovery Channel, uh, National Geographic, I pay National Geographic. But I, I typed in wars in Europe here for uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. And it comes what comes up with the Thirty Years' War, European history, 1618, 1648, the Iroquois, Iroquoians of Heronia, uh, dating uh, the, the years from 1754 to 1763, the Christmas Truce, uh, World War I. Uh, then they talk, talk about the Balkan Wars, uh, the World War I, 1914, 1918, World War II. Uh, go ahead and finish your uh, uh, thoughts there dealing with uh, the wars in Europe. My bottom line is, you know, that now it's time for us to get off. Okay, you're breaking up. Say that Say that sentence again. You're breaking up. We must get ourselves together. We must get ourselves together. We must get ourselves together. Sam. Yes, yes. And, to and, me, it's up to us. Yep, exactly. And it's not over till we win. And that's my bottom line. We're spending too much time thinking about and talking about them. Mm -hmm. Every moment we spend talking about them is a moment we cannot spend talking about us. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And th this is one of the reasons why I say that when it comes to politics, we have to understand. So we had, you know, I, I just had uh, Professor James Small and Dr. Leonard Jeffries on the show Sunday. And one of the things Professor James Small is talking about, and you know, when Dr. J and Professor Small teach, they talk about the, the pyramid principle and the foundation gives us our uh, African history and culture. This gives us uh, and, and then that's connected to our economic empowerment, and political empowerment. Right. And we have to understand that politics is a tool. But, you know, politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, found resources and the writing of law, statutes, ordinances, amendments and treaties, their adoption, interpretation and enforcement. We should be leveraging our economics to force our political agenda and enforce our political agenda, as opposed to waiting on what are the Democrats going to do? What are the Republicans going to do? Damn all that. We need to be forcing our own agenda, taking control of our destiny, as opposed to leaving our destiny up to other people. That's the bottom line. Absolutely. Our, our, our proverb or our mantra when we get up every morning, mm -hmm. when we look in the mirror and, and love the creator that we're looking at, yes, we should say, if it is to be, it's up to me. Yes. But it can't be up to you if you don't know who you are. So it goes back to self-knowledge. And that's what I want to talk about this Saturday Yes. at the One Africa Conference. Exactly. Now, very quickly here, because we only have a few minutes left here uh, in the show. Um, the book Pan-Africanism for Beginners by Sid LaMail, pages 11 through 13. And I, I have a slide up here on the screen. I, I deal with this in a lot of my presentations. Um, he gave a brief, uh, general, easy to understand definition of Pan-Africanism. Uh, Pan-Africanism is an ideology that African people around the world and throughout the diaspora should be united. It deals with social, cultural, political, economic, material, and spiritual aspects. Okay, it doesn't matter who, and I added this in, it doesn't matter who your colonizer was or who your colonizer is. Okay, Pan-Africanism teaches that the fate of African people worldwide is intertwined and we share not only a common history, but a common destiny. Do you think that's an accurate general uh, synopsis of what Pan-Africanism is? Absolutely, and, and there's evidence of it. 
Okay. There's evidence of the cultural unity of black Africa, as Dr. Sheikh Ahmed Job has shown us, the great Senegalese scholar. Mm -hmm. When you look at the music of America, and you look at the music of Africa, when you look at dance, when you look at culture, when you look at our food, when you look at how we conduct ourselves, right. when you look at the spirituality of Nigeria, Yoruba, mm -hmm. when you look at the spirituality of Spanish-speaking Africans that practice Santeria, the French-speaking Africans who do, yes. the Portuguese-speaking Candomblé, Obia of the English-speaking Caribbean, and whether they realize it or not, the American Black Baptist minister all goes back to Africa. Okay. There yep. is a cultural unity amongst us. Right. It differs because of geographic locations and because of different influences that that environment may have. But when you get down deep inside of it, once you go back, you always get black. <laughs> once you go back, you always get black. Exactly. And 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 the, and the way I say it is, uh, the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets. The more research they do, the older we get. OK, because this archaeological discovery is coming out, man, every other week and it, they keep having to push the timelines back. You remember Juvenile had the song back that thing up like 1999. Yeah. I, I tell them, they, I said, yeah. when these archaeological discoveries come out, they keep having to back that thing up. They keep having to back the timelines up. <laughs> yeah, always. And it's going to go back even further. Mm -hmm. And it's going to go back not only further, but more accurately when we begin. To determine for ourselves yes. and we analyze our history mm -hmm. but we must do this exactly exactly you know power is the ability to define and shape reality and have other people accept your definition of reality as if we were their own as a great scholar dr wade nobles teaching us teaches us okay brother well look we're out of time here um on the african history network show here on that and am superstation wfdf let people know how they can follow you get in contact with you your website social media platforms Thank you for the opportunity, brother. Family, please go to my website, www.kabakamene.com, K-A-B-A-K-A-M-E-N-E.com. You can download my free e-course and study guide, and you can keep up with my work. You can also uh, get my books that I've written, Spirituality Before Religions, mm -hmm. Shabaka Stone, and Story of Professor William Leo Hansberry. And... Um, my Instagram page I use is my community bulletin board. I keep up, keep us up to date as to work that I'm doing, some of the ideas that I have. I post some of my ideas, and that's at Kaba Kamene, K-A-B-A-K-A-M-E-N-E. -E. And if you should be so inclined, mm -hmm. my cash app is dollar sign, mm -hmm. Kaba Kamene 7. Okay. Thank you, family, for cash your support. Dollar sign. Thank you, brother, in the hotel. Let me just get a shit. Ca ca dollar sign, Kaba Kamene 7. Okay. And also, uh, yeah. shout out to Amadeus Christ as well. Uh, Kaba is in the documentary uh, Out of Darkness from uh, director Amadeus Christ. And uh, I, I know Amadeus, we've done a screening together of the documentary. But also, uh, Heavy is the Crown, this new documentary from uh, director Amadeus Christ is coming out. And Professor Kaba and Professor James Small or in the uh, new documentary, Heavy is the Crown as well. Okay, uh, brother, we'll and, look. And, Go know, ahead. Heavy is the Crown, I filmed in Detroit. Yeah, you filmed that in Detroit. Okay. All right. He filmed me for a documentary. It, it's dealing with business, so I guess it's ho hopefully it'll come out in the next couple of years. He filmed me. Uh, 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 it, was about, it was at Nandy's Knowledge Cafe he filmed me when she was on Woodward Avenue. He filmed me there a few years ago. Well, okay. Yeah, so okay. All right, all right, brother. Yeah, okay. All right, brother Cabo. Look, you have a good night. Hotel to you and the family. Congratulations on the new grandbaby. Also, I talked to your wife tonight. She told me you <laughs> you have a new grandbaby. <laughs> That's it. Yep. I call her Kika. Kika. Sage, Sage Rose. Thank you, my brother, and the very best to you and to yours and to all that are listening. Yes. Keep in mind, keep on keeping on. It ain't over till we win. Yeah. And for our children, the mm. future wealth of the planet is solar power. Yep, solar power. And isn't it interesting where the where the sun shines the brightest, mm -hmm. the people are the most melanated. It's like the creator put wealth in our backyard. Right. All we'll right, brother, we're together. out of time. Hotel, have a good night. All right, everybody. Thanks for uh, those watching okay. on Facebook and YouTube. Keep watching for a few more minutes. We're going to keep going. We're going to try to squeeze in uh, this story here dealing with Emmett Till. Uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. Okay. All right, everybody. All right. So uh, that was Professor Kaba. Uh, Professor Kaba Kamenei. Great um, interview with him. 
And I want to um, remind you, you can still register for my new uh, 10-week online course. Uh, we had class number one on Saturday, February, uh, Saturday, April 23rd was class number one of ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Okay. And we go through, look at this history chronologically. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips. And uh, we have a preview of the class right on the homepage of our website also. I'm going to post a link here again. So the class is on sale $80, regularly $130. As soon as you register, you can watch uh, class number one that we just did. The next class is a Saturday, May 7th, because I'll be at the one Africa Power and Unity Conference. And I was trying to see if there was a way I could do uh, teach a class this weekend. I can't do it. I'll be at the conference all weekend. And then there's the gala. Uh, there's, the, there's the gala Saturday night, uh, so I, I can't. I won't be able to teach the class this weekend. Um, so next class is is Saturday, May seventh. Okay, I'm gonna post the link here. As soon as you register, uh, you can watch class number one. There's also bonus content that you can watch, and I'm uploading more bonus content also. All right, and then we also have a bundle pack where you can register for all three classes that I teach. Uh, we have a bundle pack. Uh, that's $120 that also includes um, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. OK, class number one starts up uh, Sunday, May 1st, Sunday, May 1st, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All right. And that we deal with history from 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase and the Haitian Revolution through 1968. Uh, we deal with the Civil War, what leads up to the Civil War taking place, Civil War. Uh, Reconstruction, Jim Crow era, Great Migration, World War One, World, World War Two, Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement, um, and uh, we deal with all that history. Okay, and we deal with it chronologically. So that second class starts up, starts up Sunday, May eighth. Then the third class that I teach is uh, Great African Women in History: The Mothers of Civilization. So we have the bundle pack here. If you've taken any of my online classes in the past. Email me at AHN show at African History Network dot com. AHN show at African History Network dot com. You'll get 50 percent off. All right. OK, so I want to squeeze in this uh, this next story here. This is dealing with. Um, let me see here. Let's go. Yeah, we're going to go to the Emmett Till story. All right. So I posted this article on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Uh, a few days ago, and it got over 3,000 uh, likes, got over 3,000 likes, hundreds of comments. Emmett Till's relatives want the woman who accused him prosecuted for kidnapping. Emmett Till's relatives want the woman, Carolyn Bryant Dunham, want the woman who accused him um, prosecuted for kidnapping. And what this article reveals is that there was a uh, arrest warrant? I mean, there was a um, arrest warrant for kidnapping issued in 1955 for uh, Carolyn Bryant Dunham, who was the wife of Roy uh, 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 Roy Bryant, um, who was one of the men who killed Emmett Till. The arrest warrant was never executed. Okay. It's an interesting story behind this. All right. So if we look at if we look at this article here from and, and this is from the Associated Press, it was picked up by the Detroit Free Press. I looked at a number of different articles, half the most of the articles out there picked up the story from the Associated Press. It's the same story. Uh, so it, 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 it this is from April 22nd, 2022. It says stymied in their calls for a renewed investigation into the killing of Emmett Till. Relatives and activists are advocating another possible path toward accountability in Mississippi. They want authorities to launch a kidnapping prosecution, launch a kidnapping prosecution against the woman who set off the lynching by accusing the black Chicago teen of improper advances in 1955. Now, Carolyn Bryant Dunham 
was named nearly 67 years ago in a warrant that accused her in Emmett Till's abduction. In a warrant that accused her in Emmett Till's uh, abduction. All right, now. All right, let's see here. Okay. Accused her uh, in Emmett Till's abduction. Even before his mangled body was found in a river, the Tallahatchie River. Now, FBI records show uh, that she was never arrested or brought to trial in a case that shocked the world for its brutality. So she was never put on trial. She, she was questioned, but she was a witness. And she, I'm sure, well, she was questioned, but she wasn't on trial. She wasn't charged with anything. The, the arrest warrant was never executed. Okay, so here's what happened. Authorities at the time said that Carolyn Bryant had two young children and they did not want to bother and they did not want to bother her. Dunham's, uh, Carolyn Bryant Dunham's then husband, Roy Bryant, and another man, J.W. Millam, his half brother, were acquitted of murder. Okay by an all-white jury then a few months later they were interviewed by look magazine paid four thousand dollars for the interview and they admitted to killing emmett till in the uh interview in the magazine but because of double jeopardy they could not be tried again for uh the uh, uh murder that they were um uh, acquitted on uh, acquitted of the charges now just think about this okay you have Emmett Till who's dead. So the authorities at the time, these white authorities, did not want to bother her because she had two young children. But Emmett Till was a young man and he was dead. But they didn't want to bother, quote unquote, bother this white woman. Now, relatives of Emmett Till still prefer a murder prosecution but there is no evidence the kidnapping warrant was ever dismissed. Now, it was never executed, but there's no evidence the kidnapping warrant was ever dismissed. So it could be used to arrest Carolyn Bryant Dunham and finally get her before a criminal court, said uh, uh, Jeroboo Hill, an attorney working with the Emmett Till family. Quote, this warrant is a stepping stone toward that because warrants do not expire we want to see that warrant served on her okay now she's i think she's like she's in the 80s i think she's like 87 something like that um but th there there are problems here there are many roadblocks because basically most of the witnesses have died okay um and this goes back to when we dealt with this uh a couple of weeks, uh, a couple of months ago, and even last month when the Emmett Till anti-lynching bill uh, passed and we dealt with that story, we went through the uh, report that the Department of Justice put out about their investigation and why they were closing their investigation, okay? And I know people were saying, oh, she recanted the testimony. No, uh, one, she said she did not recant her testimony Two, her daughter-in-law said she never recanted her testimony three there's no evidence that she recanted her testimony okay we'll talk about that here in just a minute because we dealt with this we dealt with this uh last month and when we dealt with this also back in um december when the case was closed uh, December 2021, when the, when the uh, Department of Justice investigation was closed. And um, once again, if you actually go through and read the Department of Justice report, here it is here. We, we went through it, uh, a lot of it here on the show. If you actually read through it, you'll see why they closed the report. Uh, the name of it is, this is uh, Emmett Till Notice to Close File. Emmett Till noticed a closed file. I'll go to it in just a minute. But it goes through step by step. It goes through step by step through the whole investigation. 
what they were able to find, what they couldn't find, lack of evidence, all of that. They go through and explain everything. All right, now, let's go back to this uh, piece here. So witnesses have died in the, in the decades since Emmett Till was lynched, and it's unclear um and it's unclear what evidence what happened to evidence collected by investigators it's unclear what happened to evidence collected by investigators even the location of the original warrant is a mystery they don't know where the original warrant is it could be um in boxes of old courthouse records in the floor county mississippi where the abduction occurred now, a relative of Emmett Till said it's long past time for someone to arrest Carolyn Bryant uh, Dunham in Emmett Till's kidnapping, if not for the slaying itself. Quote, Mississippi is not the Mississippi of 1955, but it seems, uh, but it seems to still carry some of that era of protecting the white woman, said Deborah Watts, a distant cousin of Emmett Till, who runs the Emmett Till Legacy Foundation. Now in her late 80s and mostly living in Raleigh, North Carolina, Carolyn Bryant Dunham has not commented publicly on calls for her prosecution. She did not seem to know she had been named in uh, an arrest warrant in Emmett Till's abduction until decades later, said Dale Killinger a retired FBI agent who questioned Carolyn Bryant Dunham more than 15 years ago. He said, quote, I think she didn't recall it. She acted surprised. I think she didn't recall it. She acted surprised. She's 88 years old because I, I have a, another article here from Yahoo News that they picked up from AtlantaBlackStar.com. So I have a news. She's right around 87, 88 years old. Okay. Um, so here's a picture of her here and her husband. All right. Uh, back at the trial. September 22nd, 1955. Carolyn Bryant rests her head on her husband, Roy Bryant's shoulder after she testified in Emmett Till uh, murder court case in Sumner, Mississippi. Okay. Uh, now, the Justice Department closed its most recent investigation of the killing in uh, December of 2021 when the agency said Carolyn Bryant Dunham had denied an author's claim, author Timothy Tyson, had denied his claim that she had recanted her claims about Emmett Till doing something improper to her in the store where she worked in the town of Money, Mississippi. The writer, Professor Timothy Tyson, could not produce. Now, this is this is extremely important. OK, he could not produce any recordings. He could not produce any recordings or transcripts to back up the allegation, authorities said, that he basically started making about a month before he went on his book tour to promote his book about Emmett Till, they're called the blood of Emmett Till. The, Emmett Till's relatives met in March of 2022 with officials, including District Attorney uh, Dwayne Richardson, the lead prosecutor in LaFleur County, but left unsatisfied, Deborah Watts said. Quote, there doesn't seem to be the determination or courage to do what needs to be done, end quote. Well, see, the, the, the tricky thing is that you, you, you have to have evidence. And that's like was frustrating here. This is a 67 year old case. Basically, most of the witnesses are dead. You, you have to have evidence. Richardson has been in office for, for about 15 years and was the first black person to serve as president of the Mississippi Prosecutors Association. He did not return phone messages or emails seeking comment about a potential kidnapping case. Now, um, okay, so read the rest of this here. I want to go to, uh, I want to go to this clip here from, 
uh, this is from WJTV Channel 12. Uh, I think they're in Mississippi. And this is uh, Emmett Till relatives. Till relatives seek accusers prosecution in 1955 kidnapping. All right, let's go to this clip here. Relatives of Emmett Till are hoping to launch a new investigation and prosecution against Carolyn Bryant Donham, the woman who accused him of improper advances. Now, FBI records show Donham was named nearly 67 years ago in a warrant that accused her in Till's abduction. Even before Till's body was found, she was never arrested or even brought to trial. Now in her late 80s and most recently living in Raleigh, North Carolina, Donham has not commented publicly on calls for her prosecution. Prosecution. She did not seem to know she had been named in an arrest warrant in Till's abduction until decades later. Till's relatives met in March with officials, including District Attorney Dwayne Richardson, the lead prosecutor in the case, but left unsatisfied. A distant cousin of Till, Deborah Watts, says there doesn't seem to be the determination or courage to do what needs to be done. Emory University. Okay, so so I searched and searched and searched. I found very little um, news coverage on this. I saw some articles. I found very little news coverage on this development here. Very little news stories from like lo local news outlets, local TV stations. I ain't see something from MSNBC, things like that. All right. Uh, but that's WJTV Channel 12. Uh, I don't know. I think that's out of Mississippi. Now, there was another article from this one here is from Yahoo News, and they picked up this story from AtlantaBlackStar.com. It's called By Any Means Necessary, Emmett Till's Family Calls on Authorities to Use 19, um, it's actually 1955 kidnapping warrant to apprehend woman who wrongly accused the teen, the Chicago teen. For some reason, in the title, they put 1995. It's 1955. They need to proofread this. So it may have been a mistake from Yahoo News when they picked it up, or it may have been a mistake from AtlantaBlackStar.com. I'm not sure. Okay, this article here is 1955, not 1995. All right, by... Uh, Nayamiki, uh, Nayamiki uh, Daniel. This is from Wednesday, April 27th. Okay. So, one of the things here that they talk about, um, in the article, we scroll down here, Roy Bryant. I want to go here, the Duke University professor. Okay, U.S. Department of Justice reopened a closed investigation into Emmett Till's murder and kidnapping in 2017 after a professor, Timothy Tyson, wrote in a book, the book is called The Blood of Emmett Till, that Carolyn Bryant Dunham confessed to him about lying in court about the events leading up to the crime. Okay, now. Once again, when that story broke in 2017 and the headlines were saying that she recanted her story and all this stuff, I read numerous articles on this. I talked about it here on this show, the African History Network show. But I still had questions because I kept reading and reading and reading. And I'm like, OK, where's this smoking gun that you said that you had? And, 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 and the biggest smoking gun that I could find in statements from Professor Timothy Tyson was he said that she gave him uh, a readout of the transcript and he said she pointed to a portion and said that's not true. But he never said what was not true. He, he put out a statement that said, she said, uh, nothing that boy did could justify what happened to him. Well, we know that. That's, still, that's not evidence either. So if we look at this article here, um, he wrote in a book that Carolyn Bryant Dunham confessed to him about lying in court about the 
events leading up to the crime. Duke University professor Timothy Tyson said Carolyn Bryant Dunham told him in 2008, okay, very important, 2008, he interviewed her twice. In 2008, her daughter-in-law was present for both interviews, okay? He, he said that Carolyn Bryant Dunham told him in 2008 that Emmett Till had ne uh, never held her race, uh, never held her waist, touched her hand, and said, how about a date, baby? This is what he alleged that she said in an interview he did in 2008. Dunham, who is now 88 years old, de denied recanting her story when questioned by the FBI because the FBI launched this investigation in 2017 because of the um, the the statements that Timothy Tyson was saying. And he said he had the evidence and he did two interviews, things like this. Well, when it came time to put up a shut up. He said he lost one of the interviews. It, they were audio recordings. He said he lost one of them. He turned one over to the, he turned the one he still had over to the FBI. The FBI said, okay, there's no recantation in this interview that you submitted to us. And then they 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 put in they put in the report, they said that he kept changing his story of whether or not he actually recorded her recanting her story or or not because he provided no evidence that she recanted her story he said he lost one of the uh he said he lost one of the interviews now he interviewed her because he was writing a book he said he lost one of the interviews it was an audio recording you don't back up your audio recordings on external hard drives. I'm not writing a book. I have seven external hard drives. You don't, you don't, you don't back up. You interviewed her for your book in 2008. Now, first question I have to ask, and I've, and I've said this here on the show before, if you interviewed her in 2008 twice and you thought you had smoking gun evidence, why the hell you wait to 2017 and say something about it a month before your book came out? That's the first question I have to ask. If you did two interviews with her in 2008 and you're writing your book, you interviewed her for your book, okay? And now you got smoking gun evidence. Why'd you wait nine years to say something about this smoking gun evidence? Now, Professor Timothy Tyson did not record the confession. Federal prosecutors said it would be impossible to prove that she did recant her testimony because they don't have any evidence she did it. Just him saying he, she, she spilled the beans and he has no evidence she spilled the beans. Carolyn Brian Dunham did not explicitly say that the physical encounter did not happen. The Department of Justice closed the case in December 2021. This is why you got to read this stuff. Get past the headlines. Get past the emotions. Read this stuff. Because I was skeptical back in 2017 when this information came out and all the headlines. I read all that stuff and I'm like, okay. Now you say you got a smoking gun and all this stuff and she spilled the beans and she recanted. I'm reading these articles. I'm like, I'm reading his statements. Where's the recantation? Where's the evidence? A Mississippi grand jury declined to bring manslaughter charges against Carolyn Bryant Dunham in 2007, citing a lack of sufficient evidence. In 2004, federal authorities opened an investigation into the murder as part of this cold case initiative, but determined years later that the Department of Justice lacked ju jurisdiction to bring federal charges. Once again, where's your evidence? Quote, the government's reinvestigation found no new evidence suggesting that 
either the woman or any other living person, because all the witnesses basically are dead, that either the woman or any other living person was involved in Emmett Till's abduction and murder, end quote, the Department of Justice said in the December 6, 2021 media release, which is, and this is their 16 page report right here. We went through this on this show to break this down and show you why you have to get past the headlines and actually read this stuff. The Department of Justice said in the media release, December 6, quote, even if such evidence could be developed, no federal hate crime laws existed in 1955. Even if, because because the, the law ain't retroactive. The immaterial anti-lynching bill that just passed is not retroactive to 1955. Okay, the immaterial anti-lynching law that just passed is not retroactive to 1955. They didn't have federal hate crime laws in 1955. And the statute of limitations has run on the only civil rights statutes that were in effect at the time. And then also the statute of limitations for perjury is between about five to seven years, depending upon the state. It depends upon the state. The trial was 67 years ago. Okay, now, very quickly here, because we're running out of time and I have a lot of work to do. If we go back and uh, look at this report that we looked at before, and I'm just going to focus on pages four and five. You can go read the rest of it. This is the actual uh, report that the Department of Justice put out uh, when they closed the case. Let's see if I can pull this up here. Okay. Okay, this is it right here. This is at justice.gov, which is the official website of the Department of Justice. I strongly encourage people to go to justice.gov and do some research. All the press releases and things like this, all the news done with the Department of Justice is at justice.gov. So if we look at this briefly here, um, I want to focus. This is from December 6, 2021. I want to focus on pages. Is it? Yeah. Pages four and five. Section D. Which uh, is titled Timothy Tyson's claim that. Uh, they have her name blacked out, recanted her testimony. Carolyn Bryan Dun Dunham recanted her testimony. Okay, hold on. Where's the actual body of this that I want? Prosecutor uh, Kristen Clark. Where's the body of this? Okay, hold on, let me pull this. Okay, this is what I want right here. It's notice to close file. Emmett Till, notice to close file. This is what I want. That's what the document is called. Emmett Till, notice to close file. Okay, if we scroll down, I want to go to page four. Okay, section B, I want to go to section D. 
Okay, this section C deals with the 2004 federal investigation. I want to deal with section D. Timothy Tyson's claim that Carolyn Bryant recanted her testimony. No additional investigative steps were taken by the federal or state government in the next decade. Then shortly before the publication of his book, The Blood of Emmett Till in 2007, Timothy Tyson, the professor, Then shortly before the publication of his book, The Blood of Emmett Till, in 2017, Timothy Tyson re revealed in several media, two several media outlets that Carolyn Bryant had during an interview with him near, nearly a decade earlier, recanted the account that she had provided under oath with uh, under oath during a hearing at uh, the trial of uh, Roy Bryant, her husband, and uh, J.W. Miller, okay? So you have to ask yourself this question. Now, just look at this here. If you got this smoking gun evidence and you're saying she recanted testimony, things like this, why would you wait almost a decade to say something about it? and reveal it to several media outlets, okay, shortly before the publication of your book about Emmett Till. Does that sound suspicious to you? I'm just asking, does that sound suspicious to you? Does that, does it, I mean, um, sounds suspicious to me. I've been doing radio 12 years. That, that sounds really suspicious to me. Now, Timothy Tyson's account suggested that uh, Carolyn Bryant Dunham lied in court and lied during the FBI's 2004 investigation, okay? Because they investigated her in 2004. She didn't recount her testimony. They couldn't prove she was lying in 2004. Now, she may have been lying, but you have to have evidence to prove it. If you, if you charge her and you go to court, She's going to have defense attorneys. The burden of proof is on the prosecution. You have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that she that she lied, recant her testimony, lied to the FBI. OK, you can't you can't try her for what she said at the trial. But if they can prove that in the interview the FBI did in 2004 with her, that she lied to statements that she gave the FBI, they can prove that that she lied. Now you can file perjury charges based upon the 2004 investigation, not based upon what she said on the witness stand in 1955. The statute of limitations already ran out for perjury in the 1955 case. Specifically, Timothy Tyson stated that Carolyn Bryant Dunham admitted that her representation uh, that Emmett Till had made verbal and physical advances toward her in the store was quote unquote not true. This is the claim Timothy Tyson made. In the book, his book, The Blood of Emmett Till, which was published the following month, Timothy Tyson wrote that Carolyn Bryan Dunham said, quote, I have thought and thought about everything about Emmett Till, the killing and the trial telling who did what to who. And then she murmured, quote, they're all dead now anyway. He wrote that while trying hard to distinguish fact from uh, remembrance, Carolyn Brian Dunham revealed a story different from what he thought he knew about the incident. Specifically, he represented that Carolyn Brian Dunham handed him a transcript of sworn testimony and claimed that part's not true. Okay. Now I read, I read that statement in 2017 when the information came out. I'm, I asked, I'm asking the same question right now that I asked in 2017, what part's not true. 
He then wrote, if that part's not true, I asked what did happen that evening, decades earlier. According to him, she said, I want to tell you, honestly, I just don't remember. It was 50 years ago. You tell these stories for so long that they seem true, but that part is not true. Nothing that boy did could ever justify what happened to him. We know nothing he did could justify what happened to him. That's not evidence. That part's not true. I'm asking the same question today in 2022 that I asked in 2017. What part's not true? Timothy Tyson didn't say. And if he did say, he couldn't provide evidence to prove that she recanted any testimony. In the book, Professor Timothy Tyson identified a September 8th, 2008, a September 8th, 2008 interview with Carolyn Brian Dunham and accompanying handwritten notes by the author as his sources for these and other statements of Carolyn Bryant's including, included throughout his book. Professor Timothy Tyson also relied upon a draft memoir uh, of Carolyn Bryant uh, a draft memoir Carolyn Bryant had written, but had not published. Now, Tyson's claim of Carolyn Bryant Dunham's recantation understandably caused, caused outrage in Mississippi and around the country, and it was widely reported by numerous news outlets in both print and television media. Interested parties questioned whether having recanted her prior statement, Carolyn Brian Dunham could be punished for her previous lies. If confirmed, a recantation of Carolyn Bryant's account of what happened inside the store would raise questions about previous would raise questions about previous about the previous federal and state decisions to decline prosecution. The department's previous conclusion about what role, if any, Carolyn Bryant had in Emmett Till's abduction and murder, and whether any other person previously identified was complicit in the underlying crimes. And of course, a recantation would directly contradict both her testimony and the state proceedings in 1955 and the statement she provided to the FBI during the previous investigation. The current investigation, which ended December 2021, was designed to identify evidence corroborating Tim Professor Timothy Tyson's claim that Carolyn Bryant Dunham recanted her 19. 55 testimony and whether there was additional evidence identifying one previously unknown information having been complicit in Emmett Till's abduction and murder two any previous unknown living subject and three a basis to support any other federal or state charges in re-examining these issues the FBI interviewed they interviewed Carolyn Bryant Dunham. They interviewed Timothy Tyson, the professor, and persons close to or associated with them. In addition, the government also re-interviewed uh, the last surviving member of the group of young men who accompanied Emmett Till to uh, the grocery and meat market that uh, Carolyn Bryant uh, worked at and who was present and this person was present when Emmett Till was abducted from his relative's home. The FBI also obtained and reviewed other relevant documents, conducted forensic computer analysis, and consulted with case agents familiar with the earlier investigation. The FBI quickly identified a significant obstacle in the investigation. P Professor Timothy Tyson conducted two separate interviews with Carolyn Bryant Dunham and recorded and transcribed both interviews. Okay. 
However, the key statements that Carolyn Bryan Dunham reportedly made to Professor Timothy Tyson recanting her testimony were neither recorded nor transcribed. Were neither recorded nor, nor transcribed. So he didn't record them, he didn't write them down. The FBI learned that Professor Timothy Tyson had lost one of the recordings, the one during which Carolyn Bryant reportedly recanted her earlier statements and sworn testimony. Still don't understand why you why you didn't back up your audio recordings on external hard drives. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Moreover, Professor Timothy Tyson, now this is really important right here. Professor Timothy Tyson gave inconsistent explanations of whether of whether there had ever been a recording of the admission and if not why none had been made because he talks about how okay he she started spilling the beans before he could start recording so did you record her recanting testimony or you didn't record her recanting recanting testimony do you have evidence that she recanted testimony or you don't have evidence? Still trying to figure out why it took you nine years to say something and you interviewed her in 2008, but you waited to 2017 about a month before your book came out to say something. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Professor Timothy Tyson also gave differing accounts as to when Carolyn Bryan Dunham made the recantation. And Tyson told investigators that although Carolyn Bryan Dunham did not specifically identify any part of her testimony as untrue, this is important right here. This is why you've got to read past headlines and actually do some damn research. Professor Timothy Tyson told investigators that although Carolyn Bryan Dunham did not specifically identify any part of her testimony as untrue, he understood from the context of their conversation that she was referring to her allegation that Emmett Till had physically accosted her in the store and that this connection was recorded in his written notes. Professor Timothy Tyson's notes, however, do not include such a connection. Yeah, you go into court with that if you want to. That ain't going to work. That's not evidence. These facts would preclude the government from proving beyond a reasonable doubt that Carolyn Bryan Dunham recanted her previous testimony when speaking with Professor Timothy Tyson in 2008, and therefore that she lied to the FBI when she did not have done so. Read the rest of this. This is what I'm trying to explain to people. You got to get past headlines. I've been doing this for a long time. I had questions back in 2017. I'm like, okay, okay I'm reading this stuff. I see the headline, recanted testimony, all this stuff. Okay, now I'm going through, where's the evidence? Uh, you can read the article also from the uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com. Now, uh, interesting portion here in the article because they talk about um, interesting piece here in the article because they talk about uh, other accomplices that apparently are dead as well. And this was it because uh, the investigation, let me see, where is that? Let me see. Uh, they talk about um, other people who were involved in the kidnapping, black men helped them. Okay. According to reports, at least four white men tortured and hung the 14 year old Emmett Till from the rafters in a barn before dumping his body in the river a woman and man took him from his uncle's home and three black men helped keep him in the back of a truck the mississippi center for investigative reporting found 
Emmett Till's relatives have continuously revived calls for Dunham to be charged in the teenager's murder. Okay, read the rest of this article. Now, quick update to the story that we covered on Monday's show. Also, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Okay, this helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills, buy all these ink cartridges and paper and all this stuff that I go through, pay for it. these services, helps pay for these services that I use to do the show and all of this we have the information on the home page of our website this is the official cash app account dollar sign the ahn show through cash app dollar sign the ahn show through cash app also through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show we have the uh, paypal button there when you go to our cash app account it says michael and shows my picture there these other ones here are fake african history network cash app accounts that i'm trying to get shut down cash app has opened up uh an investigation into them i finally uh was able to get to somebody in in um at cash app and explain what was going on let me post this here all right now we talked about the uh wells fargo story uh on monday and that we play the excerpt of the um press conference that took place and where is that um black uh black enterprise had this article here um civil rights attorney ben crump civil rights attorney ben crump uh says wells fargo discriminatory uh loan practices is killing uh black opportunity and this deals with wells fargo um allegedly discriminating against um what's that allegedly discriminate against uh african americans trying to refinance uh their home mortgages okay so there was a story that i saw uh, so there's a class action lawsuit filed. We know there was a press conference held on um, Monday, April 25th. There was a good uh, story by a local news source, local news station, WSB TV uh, out of Atlanta. Class action lawsuit claims Wells Fargo discriminates against black borrowers. I want to go to this story here. Where is that? Okay, right here. Okay, let's go to this. Uh, let's go to this clip here. And this is this story here from WSB TV Channel 2. Um, out of Atlanta. And I need to get past the um, ad. But a class action lawsuit alleges uh, the banking giant Wells Fargo discriminates against African American borrowers at all stages of the home loan process. Um, Henry Yamina is a IT professional with a sterling credit record and he had uh, down payment money ready to purchase a home but he said there was no explanation for why his mortgage with wells fargo where he's banked for two decades was never approved uh i keep i, I keep waiting and i pushed the closing date from april to may and from may to june and meanwhile i was still renting uh yamina said uh he finally went elsewhere uh, for a loan. Now, he's one of the named plaintiffs in the class action lawsuit against Wells Fargo. Attorneys behind the lawsuit gathered with clients at the Mount Zion Second Baptist Church 
in Atlanta's historic old fourth ward to discuss the case. They're discriminating against black people and it's systemic, uh, Benjamin Crump said. Uh, the lawsuit alleges Wells Fargo denies mortgages for black borrowers more often, charges higher interest rates for black borrowers, charges them higher costs and fees, and offers African-Americans fewer refinancing uh, opportunities. Okay, let's go to this uh, Let's go to this clip here. Just a second. All right. Discriminating against African American Action News investigation uncovers allegations of racial discrimination against Wells Fargo Bank. A lawsuit alleges that the bank's discriminating against African American borrowers. Wells Fargo customers who are part of the suit gathered today in Atlanta sharing some of their stories. Channel 2 investigative reporter Justin Gray covering this tonight live in Atlanta's Old Fourth Ward Park. And Justin, this is a class action lawsuit that could eventually affect thousands of people. Yeah, Justin, the class Ashton alleges that black borrowers are both more likely to be turned down for a loan and more likely to pay more for a loan at Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo tonight calling it an unfounded attack. I pay on time. My credit is good. An IT professional with a sterling credit score and down payment money ready to go. Henry Umayana said there was no explanation for why his home loan with Wells Fargo, where he's banked for two decades, was never approved. I keep waiting and I pushed the closing dates from April to May, to, from May to June. And uh, meanwhile, I was still renting. You know, Omiana finally went elsewhere for the loan. He's one of the named plaintiffs in this class action lawsuit alleging Wells Fargo discriminates against black borrowers at all stages of the mortgage process. Attorneys behind the class action gather with clients today at the Mount Zion Second Baptist Church in Atlanta's historic Old Fourth Ward. They're discriminating against black people and it's systematic. The lawsuit alleges Wells Fargo denies mortgages for black borrowers more often charges higher interest rates for black borrowers, charges them higher costs and fees, and offers fewer refinancings. I thought I was a shoe in Atlanta resident Christopher Williams long worked in finance himself and says the real estate loan Wells Fargo offered him came with a much higher rate than it should have, and then he found elsewhere. My credit score was just under 800 before I applied. When they told me my credit score, when I applied, they told me it was 100 points less. Wells Fargo characterizes the lawsuit as, quote, unfounded attacks, telling us in a statement, we are deeply disturbed by allegations of discrimination that we believe do not stand up to scrutiny. We are confident that we follow relevant government-sponsored enterprise guidelines in our decision-making and that our underwriting practices are consistently applied, regardless of a customer's race or ethnicity. Seems like the only common denominator was the color of the applicant's skin. Now, Wells Fargo counters this evening to us that it is the largest lender for home loans for African-Americans in the country. Now, the attorneys for this class action say they won't know how big the class is until they can get discovery, get documents from Wells Fargo. But they estimate that tens of thousands of black Wells Fargo customers could be impacted here. Reporting live in the old Fourth Ward neighborhood, Justin Gray, Channel 2 Action. All right. So that's from uh, WSB TV uh, channel two in Atlanta. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Uh, remember at the African history network, we focus on educating, empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. What does self-care mean to you? To us, it's an opportunity to reconnect with nature. A chance to create something remarkable. At Sage and Elm Apothecary, our handcrafted skin care and household products immerse you in Earth's sweetest nectar, connecting you to nature in a way you never imagined. See for yourself and visit us at sageandelmapothecary.com.
STEM Forward, helping our community find their place in the emerging fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Join us for our monthly live stream on our website, stemforwardedu.org. Watch, subscribe, share. Also join our mailing list to stay up to date with STEM resources and opportunities. STEM Forward, the future is now. Watch, subscribe, share.